Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Crash Course in Data Architecture here, hosted by Data IQ. Uh, we're really excited to have this webinar today. Uh, it seems like we got a lot of people who also want to learn about this topic. And uh, yeah, we have some great uh, speakers today. So my name is Claire. Uh, I'm on the marketing team here at Data IQ, and I'm uh, helping facilitate to do introductions. Um, but yes. Uh, we have Jesse Bishop here, who was a data scientist for many years, and now he's a solutions architect here at Data IQ. Uh, so you want to say hi, Jesse? Yeah, hi everybody. This is Jesse. <laughs> Um, and we also have Christina Shao, who is a tech evangelist here at Data IQ, and uh, she is really helping people uh, by talking to them and understanding their data needs and solutions. So, Christina, you want to say hi? Hello, everyone. Glad to be here. Um, thank you. Uh, so, just a quick rundown of the agenda for the webinar, and then we'll get started. Um, so we've done the introductions already. First, we're going to talk about different components that make up a data architecture, and then go into some of the key considerations, so looking at storage, uh, access and security, computation. We'll talk a little bit about distributed computing in the cloud before wrapping up with some takeaways and time for questions at the end. So you're free to ask questions. There's a spot on Bright Talk where you can add them in uh, throughout the presentation, but we will get to those at the end, so just hold that until then. Um, yeah, and take it away. Okay. Okay, so hello, everybody. This is Jesse. So, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to tee up the topic a little bit. We're going to be talking about data architecture. So, I mean, you know, what is that in, in a really high level? I mean, to me, the simplest data architecture is me working on my laptop. That's how I got started in data science, you know, ingesting uh, a CSV and, you know, playing with it in Python and doing all my computation in memory and storing everything locally. Right, so that is a very simple data architecture, but it's one that's used by a surprising amount of people. Um, but you know, what we want to talk about is: Have you ever gotten a file that's too big for Excel, or something that was too big to process in Python in memory, right? Or maybe too big to store in your hard drive? What do we do then? So all those next steps that constitutes uh, data architecture. So what we're going to be talking about today is scaling out data architecture to meet organizational needs. This is what we're really talking about. As your organization scales, how do you maintain agility and handle increased data volume, uh, increased data computation demand? Right? So in terms of considerations as we go through this talk, we're going to be thinking about you know, data is meaningful when, we're, when it's being used. Uh, we don't want to just store data just for the sake of storing it. This is not infrastructure just for the sake of having an infrastructure. So we want to be really purpose-driven as we think about you know, these choices we're making. Uh, and we also want to think about planning the data architecture for the future, right? A data architecture that can evolve, um, you know, and be consistent, uh, be secure, and, you know, can take advantage of modern data science methods uh, that are going to keep your team up to date and using you know, the latest the tools and methods. Okay? So that's at a very high level. So this is kind of a map of what a one simple company might do with data. Right. So here we're going to be looking at you know, Bob's store, uh, Bob's flower shop, where we have a customer browsing around on the website. Right. So generating some data about uh, pages she's visiting and purchases that she's making. Right. So what are we going to do with that data? First, we've got to find somewhere to store that. Um, you know, store that securely, as we can see by the icon. Maybe we have to comply with the GDPR in this case. Right? And then we've got to get that data from storage into a compute where we're going to run a machine learning model. Right? And from there, uh, we're going to take the results of that machine learning model, pipe that back to Bob, who's going to use that to make some decisions about marketing that are going to drive value for his organization. Right? So just in that simple example, uh, we walked through five different steps of a data architecture. Okay, so. We're going to break this into roughly acquisition, storage, security, the computation that he was doing on his machine learning model, and then the value creation part. Right? So, you know, again, and you can think about these steps even in a really simple, you know, how did you do this on your laptop in, in the simplest data architecture? So, 
keeping these components in mind, when we go back to our map of Bob's flower shop, right? So we can map, you know, data acquisition was the first step uh, with Alice browsing the website, security, storage, computation on the ML, uh, and then the actual value creation where Bob was sending out these successful marketing campaigns. Okay, so for today, uh, we're going to focus on the storage, security, and computation part of the data architecture. Okay, so uh, as we turn to storage, I'm going to turn this over to Christina. Thanks, Jesse. So uh, let's first talk about some basic properties of raw data. Uh, if you go to the next slide, when, when most of us think of the term data, if you're like me, you're actually visual, visualizing structured data in your mind, maybe in a tabular form like an Excel spreadsheet. So structured data is organized and it's formatted in a predictable and consistent way, and it tends to be more straightforward to input and search and to manipulate. And uh, by contrast, as the name would suggest, unstructured data really has no predefined format or organizing schema, which often makes it more difficult to collect and store and analyze. So common examples of unstructured data include text and images and audio formats. And in fact, a lot of the data science work that we do is geared towards applying structure to these unstructured sources to make them more easily quantified and characterized for business purposes. So it's, it's hard to believe, but over 80% of enterprise data is actually unstructured, um, which comes as a surprise to me every time I hear that. Um, so if you go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about data types. Now, we, we call this a crash course, so you're going to get a bit of a primer on all these different um, shapes and sizes and volumes of data because they really come from disparate sources that are built for different operational purposes. So, for example, if you're a retailer like Bob, you have point of sale data from um, transactions. You have individual customer information like the person's name and address clickstream data from the website, photos, uh, online customer reviews, and many more. So different types of data require different storage, and it's important to consider what types of operations you expect that data to support as you plan your data architecture. So let's introduce some broad categories. Uh, the first category is relational databases, maybe the easiest because it has that familiar row and column structure like the Excel spreadsheet I mentioned. And uh, these can usually be queried and managed using a structured query language, or SQL. So for that reason, you might hear these grouped together as SQL or SQL databases. Now, over on the right side are categories that you consider NoSQL. And that stands for non-SQL or not only SQL. And each of these four types is a little bit different. So for example, key value stores, you can think of as a hash table or a dictionary, where you have a key, uh, that uniquely identifies a record, and the record is stored and retrieved using that key in the database. Um, now, unlike the relational tables, you don't need to store optional values as placeholders, and so they often require far less memory to store the same information as a relational database in that key value store. And th they're often used for things like storing session information in your web applications or your mobile app. Now, if you go down, document stores are a subclass of this, of key values, that really store all the information for a given object in a single instance. And what's important is that every stored object can be different in terms of content and format and metadata. And due to the flexibility of that, they're perfect for storing that unstructured or, or user-generated content like videos and images and comments. So column stores um, kind of turn the, the relational database on its head and they store data in columns instead of rows. And so they're very fast at computing statistics on those columns, faster than, than the relational, because you don't have to read in the entire table just to calculate like an age. You just go down the whole column. Um, so you might use columnar storage for IoT data if you have Fitbits or health trackers. Or if you're a shipping company, for example, you might record um, parcel events in column stores. And lastly, graph databases. A graph is nothing more than a node, which represents an entity, like a person or a place or a category, and um, a relationship. So each relationship, which is kind of a line that you see here, represents how two nodes are associated. And this structure of, of the network is often used for things like fraud detection and social network analysis uh, or recommendation engines. And then lastly, we have the good old file system. 
Okay, just like Jesse was saying, when he did the work on his laptop, he probably stored stuff locally in his file system. Um, and it's a directory of folders which contain heterogeneous files of many types. But file systems have matured a lot in the last decade or two with the advent of big data technologies going all the way back to Google File System and MapReduce and Hadoop, of course. So on the next slide, we've added some common names to this categorization structure to just pl place these mentally for you in, in the buckets that I just mentioned. Um, now, up to this point, I haven't made a distinction between databases that you install and you, ma you manage yourself on premises or at your own data centers versus those that are stored in the cloud and accessed via the internet. But some of these icons that you see here are cloud native. Um, so for example, Snowflake there under relational databases or Amazon S3. And for those of you who know Amazon S3, you're probably thinking, but it's not really a file system, it's an object store. But I think conceptually for those of you who are new to this, it's easy to think about S3 as like a collection of various data objects that are stored in a big folder called a bucket and they're labeled in a meaningful way. Um, <clears throat> so the last thing I'll say on this is just an important thing to note that we'll come back to later is that most of these systems that you see here not only store data, but they also serve as computation engines, meaning you can do stuff to the data, query it, manipulate it, analyze it right where it lives in storage without moving it out first. Okay. Go ahead, Jesse. Go to the next slide. Sure, yeah. And so I wanted to turn now to talk about security. We mentioned this in the context of Bob's business, uh, where he's collecting data from the web and he's got to store it somewhere uh, and store it securely. Um, so, I mean, this is obviously a huge topic. You know, we have headlines is way too often about major breaches, uh, you know, Facebook security breach, the Equifax one that was major. You know, I think I have a $50 check coming uh, at some point uh, from that. You know, but we, we hear about these things all the time, and so it's really important uh, to keep this in mind. And we can see that even the largest enterprises sometimes don't do a great job about this. Uh, but I just wanted to introduce a few concepts around this. Uh, and so within security, uh, there's three kind of levels. And we can use the metaphor of going to an airport and getting on a plane for this. Um, so the first step is authentication, right? How do I know, uh, or how does the system know that I am who I am? Right? And so that would correspond roughly to my passport or my you know, ID that I present uh, when I'm getting in line for security. Right? So it's just something to say that, okay, I am Jesse Bishop and that's my identity. It doesn't say that I have the ability to do anything at this airport, just that I am who I say I am. The next step is authorization. That's like my plane ticket. It says, okay, I, Jesse Bishop has the right to get on this plane. Right? The ticket has no idea of who I am but it does say that I'm authorized uh, to, to go through security and to get on the plane, right? So that's actually giving the permission. Uh, and then the last piece is auditability. Uh, the metaphor gets a little bit wonky here, but you can imagine because I have a seat assigned, right? If I spill like, you know, some Pepsi all over the seat and, you know, like make a mess, they will know who did it, right? Because I was assigned to a particular seat. So what we're really talking about is when the user comes into the system, if they make a mess of things, do I know who it was? Okay, so this is really important to trace back what changes were made by who, and not just some big soup of things changing kind of at random. Okay, so, and going from there, now what are we authorizing these people to do? I mean, in the airport metaphor, it was to take a plane trip. But, you know, in reality, there's a lot more fine-grained permissions that we can assign than either get on this plane or don't. Um, so the key concepts here is, you know, the most basic thing you could do uh, in, you know, uh, with the data that, for example, we are collecting uh, from the Internet, can we just see it? Can I see what happens? Can I see the logs? Can I see the records? Just read it. Uh, read ability has no uh, you know, ability to, say, change the data, right? So that's just looking at it. Um, that's the most basic level. Now, when we get into write, uh, permissions, that says, aha, I can now modify this data. I can delete this. Uh, I can add new data, right? So this is beginning to give you a lot of capabilities uh, within that storage system. And then finally, execute. If there are programs, uh, you know, I can actually run 
programs from within uh, this file system and really make systematic changes to the data. So this is really giving me a lot of power over what's happening uh, within, within the data. So just you know, some things to be clear, and we want to think about this as we're designing our security setup. We want to give the fewest permissions possible to the people that need it. Right? So who needs to just read this data? Who needs, needs to have access to it? Um, so this is really a judgment call that companies are making every day about assigning these permissions to different users. And that's where a lot of you know, key decisions are being made uh, around security. Um, so again, you know, we showed GDPR in the first example. So GDPR is simply a combination of these concepts. Who has access to what data? You know, in GDPR's case, it's about when is there personally identifiable information? We can set up conditionally uh, who is able to have access to that. You know, but we really, it's about using these concepts that we just defined uh, to give the fewest number of people access to sensitive data. And so all regulations, you know, they're going to be changing constantly. I didn't want to talk about one in particular, but they're all going to be combinations of these particular concepts, who has access to certain types of data, uh, who can read it, who can write it, et cetera. So we need to really be thinking about who can do that. And from there, once we have our data stored and access governed, we're going to want to do some computation on that. And so I'm going to turn it back over to Christina. Thanks. So you recall in the example with Bob that um, Bob was running a recommendation engine or maybe some marketing optimization to figure out what the right offer was to send to the right people and through what channels and so forth. And these types of machine learning algorithms take a lot more computation than um, things used to. So what happens when your volume of data or the types of analyses you're trying to run have outpaced your current hardware setup? What usually happens is you get errors saying the disk is full, the system's out of memory, or you press run and the job just spins indefinitely or crashes. So we're gonna talk now about scaling up, especially for computation. So if you go to the next slide, um, there are two main ways to increase your data storage and also your computational power. We're gonna kind of flip over to the, the second half of computation right now, but uh, vertical scaling means that you scale by adding more physical resources, so disk space, CPUs, RAM, to an existing machine. So you can imagine like this, this the origin has this single, I don't know, I think of this as a hotel bus, I guess, and then it becomes a double-decker London bus, and then it becomes a quintuple-decker bus. So that's vertical scaling, okay? Get more people onto the same bus. Whereas horizontal scaling means that you scale by adding more machines into your pool of resources. So think of this just like a fleet of regular buses. Um, now, this is neither good nor bad, they're just different. And if you, if you go to the next slide, let's talk a little bit about cost. Now, cost is important, but it is critical to know that the price tag of the hardware alone does not at all represent the total cost of ownership. There are other things that you'll need to consider as you plan your data architecture, including the skill sets of the people who run these servers, the data scientists who will have to potentially write different types of code to paste it based on your hardware and, and heating costs, cooling costs, all those types of things. But just talking about the price of the server itself, if you're a small to medium-sized business, vertical scaling can be a really effective solution. Memory and storage have gotten <clears throat> excuse me, extremely affordable recently, and it may be that a big powerful server or two does the trick. But once you get to the supercomputer land, which has a ton of memory and processors, these things can cost tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we consider, well, what about horizontal scaling, which you can also think of as distributed computing. Um, what happens is you buy a lot of commodity servers, uh, or they're bought for you, we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, and you network them together to act as a pooled mega resource, and we call that a cluster. And though we've sort of oversimplified this, you can see how the cost curve for horizontal scaling is, is relatively linear. And so at a certain point, you hit that inflection at which it may make more economic sense to just get a bunch of smaller machines and work them together than to grow a single machine. So uh, next slide, with, with distributed architecture, you have a lot of benefits. Um, you can easily 
and elastically scale up or scale down your computational needs just by adding or removing servers or nodes uh, to your cluster. Um, often, you can chunk a big job up into smaller pieces so that they run in parallel across multiple machines, giving you faster results. You might hear that as MPP, or Massively Parallel Processing, um, versus SMP, which is Symmetric Processing. If you went vertical and you had a bunch of cores on one machine. Uh, and then finally, um, the master servers and the programs that govern those networked architectures act as resource negotiators and schedule, schedulers, which is really cool because they know if one machine is overburdened, they won't send a job there. If one machine has resources, um, you know, they'll allocate it. But if it fails out, if it falls down and dies, they know to, sh you know, to seamlessly shift that machine's job to another node so that your overall job does not fail. So there's a lot of kind of smart uh, logistical orchestration happening across these distributed architectures. So one thing you might hear a lot, you know, in the last decade is I'm going to the cloud. What, it, what does that mean? Um, all of us use cloud computing services. We have Gmail and, and uh, Dropbox and all these different types of cloud offerings. Um, cloud computing is simply the, pra the practice of using a network of remote servers that are hosted on the internet to store and manage and process data rather than a local server or your personal computer. So we can think of this, um, let's use an analogy to explain this a bit more. Let's say I'm going on a big family trip and trying to decide how to get around. So the default is I drive my own personal car. This is basically me hosting everything myself locally on premises in my own data centers. So I'm driving my own car, I own it, I pay to maintain it, it has all the specs that I've chosen that I like for my daily life. However, it may not hold all the people I need to transport around on this big family trip. So perhaps I think about renting a car. This is like the analog to infrastructure as a service. I simply rent the resources that meet my needs. Or the next level above that is to add managed services on top of that, which might be like ordering an Excel Uber, uh, an Uber XL or a car service. Um, not only do I get the large vehicle, but I also get a driver whose job it is to pick us up and, and bring us around. So you can think of those as three different levels of, uh, of services. Now, the three big players, as you may be aware, are Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud P Platform, and Microsoft Azure. They're the big players in the cloud computing space, and each of them offer a wide range of products and services. So if you are thinking about scaling your data architecture to the cloud, what are some of the benefits of infrastructure as a service? Uh, on the next slide, they include uh, the ability to elastically scale up and scale down resources on, on demand, as I mentioned, um, not having the burden of maintaining or upgrading all the machines yourself, and a more resilient and fault tolerant environment. So, these cloud platforms have invested a lot in making sure they stay up and running and they don't lose your data. Um, so they, they have high availability, meaning there's few to no interruptions in services because they understand that there's a real cost to downtime uh, and it's frustrating. Uh, but they also take disk snapshots regularly and they replicate your data across different physical locations so that in the rare event that there's a hurricane or an earthquake like they had in California this week, if the server room goes down, you're still able to get back up and running with minimal impact to your business. And those are some of the, the benefits to going uh, with infrastructure as a service. These guys work off consumption-based pricing. So the more you use, the more you pay. And although um, there are no sunk costs the way you have for your own data centers, the pay-to-play model can get quite pricey. So um, Almost always a detailed cost analysis is performed before pursuing a cloud strategy. Okay, so now back to Jesse to wrap us up. Thank you, Christina. Yeah, so from here. Yeah, so, you know, I think that was a really good discussion about kind of the ways that we scale out computing, right? And I think that. Uh, especially the cloud computing is something that I hear about all the time. So it really is something to keep in mind. Um, 
yeah, so, you know, what the, the big concepts that we've been talking about today, right? So, you know, like Christina was talking about with the computing, there's many different options, right? From just buying one big machine, uh, you know, when your laptop gets, uh, you know, inadequate for the task, all the way through distributed options and Hadoop and Spark and, you know, every cloud option you've ever heard about, tons of managed services. So what are we trying to do with our data? Uh, we have a ton of options, but, you know, we don't just go with, there's no one size fits all. There's no one best answer. You know, all these different options have a time, a place uh, depending on what the needs of your business are, where you are in, in your, you know, journey uh, to becoming more data driven. Uh, data structures should Dana really uh, did a great job going through the different types of data, the different types of storage options available. You know, the first thing I ever used was Google Drive, uh, you know, so it was my first foray in the cloud architecture. But really, it's just the tip of the iceberg. And as we start dealing with this more specialized data, data streaming in from all different sources, we're really going to want to be aware of different options for storing that data the most efficiently. Um, for security, we really want to consider governance and data control in the context of value. And so that is, you know, what is the value that uh, every person's access to the data is bringing to the company, right? So we want to make sure we're not just giving that out uh, at random or giving too much, uh, too much access to our data, and also at the same time, not too little. We want the people that can drive value from the data to have access to the data that they need. Um, and so, and then also for compute, when it comes time to actually do processing on our data, you know, there's many options besides buying bigger machines. Uh, you know, I by no means have the top of the line Mac, uh, but, you know, even if I did, you know, they could, the, the needs are going to keep growing forever. And really having a grasp on what some of the options are as far as distributed computing or moving to the cloud, uh, the pros and cons of that is, is very important. So, uh, Christina, did you have anything to add as we wrap up? Uh, no, I don't. I think we, maybe we could take any questions that the audience has. Great. Um, yeah, so uh, seeing a couple questions just to start about logistics, so I'll start with those. Um, someone asked if uh, we could share the deck with the audience, and we will add it as an attachment uh, once this webinar is concluded. Uh, so you will be able to rewatch this if you'd like later. It will stay on Bright Talk um, if that is useful to you. Um, and then one question we have was looking at um, sort of, it seems like uh, there's so many things to think about with data architecture, right? Like this is, there are so many things with storage and computation and scaling. I guess the question remains still, where do you start? And if you're an organization that's trying to maybe think about your data architecture and change it, like what's a good place to begin with that? Uh, do you want to say something about it, Jesse? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, you know, starting out with data architecture, right? I mean, there are many places that we could be coming from. And, you know, so to go back to our initial example, right? So what, what is our first need? Is my data volume getting too big? You know, it, then storage might be the first thing I'm thinking about. Am I running out of memory in my Python job? Then it might be the compute that I need to scale out. Uh, so it really is about user experience, you know, what, where we're at, you know, and what our needs are. But these components that we've outlined today, any one of them could be, you know, the, the starting point for your data architecture journey. Yeah, and, and I would just add to that, to um, we say this a lot at, at Data IQ, like build, build for the future, right? So make something work today, but understand that the technology is changing fast. And in two years, it's going to be completely different what your options are. And so um, it can be easy to kind of get paralyzed and not do anything. But I, I would um, try to build in a way that does not lock you into one architecture forever because that rigidity will make it very hard for you to grow and change as the market does. Um, and then the second piece would be to also consider the, the talent, the people that it's going to take to run these different types of infrastructures because it takes a very different type of um, data engineer to work with SQL data. Different skill sets. And so from a hiring perspective, they all need to be considered in the total cost of ownership. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Christina. Uh, we're getting in a ton of questions now, so I'm glad we have a little bit of time. Uh, first question we have here is, what about Elasticsearch? Uh, can it be considered as storage for unstructured data? Or sort of how does that work? So, Christina, I don't know, do you have anything you want to say on that? Um, I don't think of it so much as storage, although it's certainly relevant. Um, I'm trying to think about where where I typically would place Elasticsearch. Um, let me look here really quickly. I had kind of originally heard of it as a document store, similar to kind mm -hmm. of MongoDB and Couchbase which is, you know, you can put a structured document which contains a rich and nested data structure in there, but each document each can be different. Um, but I think Elasticsearch, for me, is used more of a search engine. I think of it more of an overlay, you know, an alternative maybe to kind of Google search type methods. So I'm definitely mm -hmm. not an expert in that area, but for me, it doesn't immediately ring true as, as a storage as much as it does a, a search engine. Again, not my, my biggest area of expertise, though. So. Um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, great question. Uh, I think another one we have coming in is what team or department should manage a data architecture flow? Um, I know I'm obviously biased, but at DataIQ, we sort of try to think as de-siloed as possible when it comes to uh, collaboration, but definitely management is ultimately the buck has to stop somewhere. So I don't know, Jesse, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think there are different roles that you hear, some data scientist, data engineer, data architect. I mean, these are pretty fluid terms in my experience in the industry, uh, and they can mean a lot of different things. I've uh, seen people whose job title is data scientist who are very close to a data engineer. And, and these roles, so I mean, it's really hard to pin them down, but I mean, typically the architecture is going to fall to the data engineering uh, side of things, right? So a data engineer typically, in my understanding, is someone that is responsible for data flows, right? So that is exactly the three pieces of the architecture we were talking about today. Data ingestion, storage, pipelining data from the storage to the compute engine, um, th these type of tasks. Now, is that always going to be a data engineer's job? Nope. Uh, there's many different configurations. You might have a data scientist who's great at that. Uh, or you might have a data scientist that can, you know, really open up Python, and that's about it, but is, you know, really good at machine learning algorithms. So the, the distribution of these tasks uh, falls on different people, but really I think that the takeaway is that anyone, you know, from different backgrounds can, you know, if you are working with data, you're not siloed off uh, from data architecture. So this can really fall as more, as more of a team effort as well. Yeah. Um, awesome. Thank you. Uh, another question we're getting in that I can probably help out with is, uh, what is your experience in successfully quantifying ROI, so return on investment, on infrastructure expansion investment? Um, so we uh, actually on this channel have a webinar on calculating the ROI of data initiatives. Uh, so that's definitely something I would recommend checking out. Uh, it's a great talk. And I think ultimately when it comes to ROI, especially for infrastructure, because it touches on so many different aspects, but right? your entire data pipeline, all of your data processes are going to be impacted by uh, your infrastructure. Uh, at the end of the day, if you can look at sort of, and this is something that's touched upon in that webinar, what projects and processes sort of that you can do today that maybe you couldn't do before you've made this investment. So if maybe before your data team um, spent a lot of their time cleaning data, and so they uh, we're able to do four projects a year or something like that. Um, if you invest in their infrastructure, then you say, oh, well, now they can do six projects. So those two additional projects that you get um, is new value. And that's a really simple way of looking at it, but it's um, something that is pretty easy to quantify and it's easy for people to understand. Um, I don't know, Jesse, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think that absolutely makes sense as a framework to evaluate into that the ROI, I and mean, that's something that can be really tricky to get a precise number on, but I think, you know, Claire's approach is a really good way to start thinking about it. Cool. Um, another question we have here is, and I think it's a really good one, are what are the challenges of moving applications to the cloud? Uh, so, yeah, Christina, do you want to touch on that? 
Yeah, sure. So um, I think probably the main one, the first one that organizations face is just lack of skills. It's a fundamentally different way of working with data and people who have been um, very accustomed to their Teradata or the Oracle database and just writing SQL queries all of a sudden find themselves needing to, to learn new languages and think about new ways of kind of working with data. So the, the talent gap, I think, is the first. Um, some, some industries, particularly highly regulated ones, have a lot of concerns about privacy and whether or not all of their data uh, PI, uh, per, you know, personally identifying information, uh, HIPAA, you know, all these types of restrictions have a lot of constraints around where data can be stored. And so I think that's holding some companies back and, and then they think, well, if I can't move all of it, why should I move some of it? And those types of considerations happen. Um, so legal concerns, security, of course, is really important with the internet. We always think about getting hacked. Um, and so security is a concern and has to be thought up, set up really thoughtfully, as, as Jesse mentioned. Um, and then another one that's a little bit of a softer thing, obviously the technical stuff is, is, is a real challenge, but I, I honestly think com company culture is a big concern. If you tell somebody all of a sudden they're, they're not working in the spreadsheet that they, they work in every single week, and now they have to use a, a Google Doc or some other type of shared database to do it, it's really hard to change people processes. Um, and, and that's where a lot of organizations get stuck, and it's not an architecture problem at all. Great. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, we've got a question come in that I think is a bit of a challenge, but I hope we can uh, tackle it. It's asking, can you share more about best practices of data pipeline setup uh, from storage to computation, uh, maintenance, and sort of how is this is a use case dependent? Um, and yeah, I think that's a really good question. Jesse, do you want to touch on that a bit? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, again, there are many different architectures and again, it's going to depend on the type of data we're talking about. Of course, are we talking about data streaming in from, you know, IOT, you know, from internet of things, uh, where it's kind of real time streams, the data that comes in once a day, uh, you know, where is it stored, all the different options, uh, that Christina talked about earlier. So depending on all that is going to really influence how we set up the pipeline of that data from storage to compute. Um, but in general, uh, that is the job of the data architect or the data engineer to set up those pipelines because we really want to have access to that data efficiently. We want to be moving that data with the lowest latency possible uh, in, a, in, a, in an efficient way. Uh, and I must say in my experience, you know, this is something that we do at Data IQ, is provide linkages between data sources where the data lives in those compute engines and optimize that. So that is also an option, is using a centralized platform like Data IQ to orchestrate that movement and to create the pipelines in a really manageable way. Yeah. Um, thanks, Jesse. I think definitely yeah, and we oh, oh, go ahead add to that too. No, no, no. Yeah. Go ahead, Claire. You finish. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say that uh, we've talked about so many different technologies. We saw the logo slides. There's so many different elements. I think the more you can simplify it out, it's sort of the like KISS acronym, right, of how simple can you keep it, that will be better off in the long run. Obviously, you need a data architecture that's right for your use cases and your organization, but uh, we found at least that centralizing it and putting it in a place where it's easier to understand uh, adds a lot of value. But what are you thinking, Christina? Yeah, I, I was just going to kind of my thoughts on that on data pipeline setup are just that it, in general, I think of it as kind of the job of IT and the administrators there to set up the tool, the tools that are in your toolbox. And so that means the data stores that we talked about, um, the types of technologies that you have for computation like Spark and, and things like that. Um, and some best practices about what you are and aren't allowed to do, and then collaboratively with the data architects who really who know the data, but maybe not the data science, those three groups, data science, data engineers or data architects, and then IT, I think work together to create data pipelines that not only work in a design environment, but also can be moved into production. So typically the, the failure, the gap that we see people fall into is they've got <clears throat> data scientists build something in a lab environment, and then when it goes over to IT, it, it needs to be hardened and refactored, and the whole thing gets torn down and rebuilt. And so by bringing 
IT closer to the design process of that original pipeline and putting some governance around that, you can, you can remove some of those roadblocks down the line. Um, awesome. Thanks, Christina. Uh, we have another question here on could speed become a bottleneck to cloud data access and management? Uh, and it goes on to say, if you consider a few thousand meters sending info in real time, storing it, and accessing it from different places, and then doing machine learning with it, sort of how does speed impact that process? Uh, so I think I'm going to pass that off to Jesse. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, you know, we talked briefly about, you know, Internet of Things technology with, you know, all these devices maybe sending streaming data into a central repository. What do we want to do with that data? So I think, again, the question here that, you know, as I work with my clients, I often ask is, what do we need from this data, right? So I think there's a tendency to want to view a lot of analysis in real time. But the question is, what does real time mean to you? So we really want to think about what is the benefit of doing something immediately with, you know, a sub-second latency versus maybe, you know, storing that and analyzing it in a batch process, you know, every couple of minutes. You know, so what are we really gaining? Because absolutely speed becomes a consideration. It can be, become very difficult to do machine learning on brand new observations coming in on a sub-second basis. And that's going to really influence our choice of architecture. It's, uh, going to become, we're going to have to use technologies that are, you know, maybe more expensive, maybe more difficult to configure. Uh, so those are all trade-offs. If we absolutely need that sub-second latency, we can, there are architecture solutions to get there. But I think something to really think about is, do I need that? And what me? Um, very close, 95% of the way to our goals by doing more of a batch process where we ingest data and then feed it through a machine learning algorithm in a, in a batch way, then maybe we can save a ton of money on our infrastructure. So these are the kind of trade-offs that are really important and that real enterprises are going through all the time. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And to echo that statement of do you always need it, um, I would say this is why that statement I made about bringing the computation to where the data lives becomes even more important. Because if you are in a place, and honestly, I don't see very many challenges because Amazon and Google and Azure have so many data centers across all these continents um, geographically spread. The latency isn't too bad, but if you are thinking, okay, I'm going to build an algorithm using 10 billion rows of data and I, I don't want to use everything to train, um, being thoughtful about it, first, as Jesse said, do I need to train on everything? But secondly, can I bring that algorithm to the data instead of piping all of it down? executing and then piping results somewhere else. And that becomes a really big part of that data pipeline we talked about is where does the computation happen so that you don't have long latencies when you're moving data around. Um, thanks, Christina. I think we only have time for about one more question because we're about to uh, run up to the edge. But uh, if you do have more questions about data architecture in general, we do have some uh, resources in the attachments to this webinar. And uh, if you have continued questions, uh, you can uh, reach us at contact at dataiq.com via email. But uh, the last question I think I want to touch on that just came in was just generally, how would, should someone develop their skills in data architecture? Like, you watch the crash course, where do you go next? Um, Jesse, do you want to touch on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, as we've seen, data architecture can mean many different things. Uh, so. The first way is by tackling a problem, right? So starting, you know, and that can be, that can be practicing on Kaggle data, right? So that just move beyond your comfort zone because for me, I, you know, started out working on only data sets that could always fit on my computer, and if they didn't, I would kind of find some way to make that happen. But to really learn data architecture when you run into a challenge like that, well, I'm working with a huge data set. What do I do? Let's actually work through that. And by getting your hands on exploring some of these uh, options, working through an actual problem to me is the most valuable way uh, to start learning the real concepts behind data architecture. Um, great. Thanks, Jesse. I think we are just about out of time. Uh, but thank you all so much for attending the webinar. And uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to leave us some feedback. And uh, have a wonderful rest of your day.